Welcome to PR Talk, sponsored by the PRSA of Oregon and part of the MPN, the Marketing Podcast Network. This is your host, Amy Rosenberg, founder of Veracity and author of A Modern Guide to Public Relations. Help other people find our podcast by subscribing, rating, giving us a review, or sharing on social media. Hi, everybody. I have Christopher Penn here. Hi, Christopher. Hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, So if you don't already know Christopher Penn, he is the co-founder and chief data scientist with Trust Insights, which is a data and analytics company for marketers. Um, He's keynote spoke, I guess, if that's a word, at many, many places. And he's written like a gajillion books. Um, And so, but today we're going to be talking about data-driven PR. But first, I have to ask Christopher, I did dig into your background and I saw that you were a tarot card reader uh, way back (laughs) when. (laughs) So tell me about that. And then my specific question about that and how it ties into our topic is, does tarot card reading have to do with data? So I did that as a way of paying rent in graduate school because, uh, you know, it's one of those things that people are very interested in. Uh, and, it, you know, it, it paid reasonably well in Boston. And in terms of data, so that, to be clear, I am very much a, a science enthusiast. And there is legitimacy to tarot card reading, but not in the way people think. It is entirely about a discipline called cold reading, where you use uh, verbal cues, selective memory, uh, and inference, essentially probability, uh, to sort of guess what people are, are, what's on people's minds using the data that you have at hand and then forecasting forward. So, for example, you look at somebody, you look at the their shoes and the kind of the wear on their shoes to uh, the condition of their hands, whether their hands are like calloused or smooth, what jewelry they're wearing. Um, the questions that they ask are going to fall in one of four buckets, right? When you ask somebody to think of a problem, it's going to be uh, relationships and sex, health, money, and and work. Are typically, the 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 big four. And so, because you understand these probabilities, you can do readings that tell people. Give, nudge people in certain directions and then that because of selective memory they fill in the rest so i may say something like well you know you're probably a person who is thinking a lot right now about uh the challenging uh, the ch- the challenging uh, job market right now and, and and what's going on with the job market notice i didn't say anything about what the challenge is the challenge is actually as a company you can't hire anybody because there's nobody to hire um Mm -hmm. But you automatically fill in the blanks based on what's going on in your head. And so it's it's using psychology uh, and statistics to give someone an experience that is memorable, I guess is the best way to put it. Okay, so (laughs) I could talk to you a lot about that. And maybe I will We'll see how it goes. But so I guess I could look at this actually, maybe from a marketing perspective in terms of like, possibly like a market marketing is kind of like a person in a way or a company is kind of like a person where you can look at the company as a whole, try and figure out what their issues might be on the on your own, and then possibly use data to back that up or kind of point you in the right direction. Is that is there any kind of similarity? Okay, absolutely. In fact, account based marketing uh, is is very much the the essence of that. And you can use firmographic and technographic data to make inferences about a company. So for example, if you go to a company's website, and you look at what's installed in the source code on the back end of the website. If you go to you know view HTML on any company's website, you'll see things in there like a Google Analytics tracking code, a HubSpot tracking code, a Salesforce tracking code, what email marketing system they used. And based on the combination of technologies that they've got going, you can make some inferences about their relative level of technical sophistication. If you see you know a, a whole stew of different systems and things, and, and there's systems that correspond to each step of the marketing automation funnel, you know they're pretty you know, far along. If on the other hand, you look and like there's not even Google Analytics on there. It's like, okay, from a a, a maturity level in analytics, you can say this company is probably not as mature. And then you know the problems that that company is likely to have um, based on where they are in their marketing technology maturity level. Okay. So what is, so when you Okay, so when we're talking about data driven PR, which I've heard you talk about, it seems that possibly, 
and I'm not sure if all marketers are doing this, but possibly marketers and especially PR people are just looking at the company itself and not necessarily and kind of making their own judgments and using possibly, you know, company leaders to help them make those judgments and then just kind of going off and doing their own thing without looking into the data. So how is that what data driven PR is? And how do you find that data? So let's step back and clarify what data driven means, because I think that's really important. When you open up Google Maps on your phone, you put in a destination and then Google Maps tells you which route to drive based on like traffic and you know uh, traffic jams and stuff like that. Uh, any stops you want to make along the way. And essentially, while Google Maps is not driving the car, Google Maps is telling you, here's how you should travel for the most optimum journey based on the data that we have. Essentially, you are making decisions, you know, which turns, which streets based on data. And that's what data driven means. And there's a lot of confusion, especially in public relations about what data driven means. It means you make decisions with data first, right? It's not, there's a whole bunch of other things you can use in your decision making process, you know, experience, intuition, uh, you know, random guesses, throwing darts at a dartboard, asking the intern. Uh, but none of those are data, right? None of those are making a decision based on the data. And if you make a decision based on data, and then we call it the hippo problem, the highest individually paid person's opinion. Then the hippo comes to the room and says, well, this is not the way we've always done it. We're going to do it the way we've always done it and overrides your decision. You are no longer data driven. You are now opinion driven. And there are situations where that might be appropriate, but you can no longer say that you are data driven. So that's the the sort of the heart of this. If you are using data to make decisions and data is the primary factor that you use to make that decision, then you are data driven. Okay. So then how do you find that data? It depends on what it is. It depends on what the situation is. So give me an example. Oh, wow. I don't have a brain today. Um, it could just be so we do a lot of B2B, right? So, you know, it's kind of like, oh, what what, what uh, organization should we get in front of? Or what kind of marketing should we, should we be involved with in terms of trade shows or, um, out, you know, targets? W what targets should we get in front of? What, and, and actually, but it's, the, it's harder than that. It's more about like, what's going to change the outcome, right? So it's not really even a specific uh, example. It's like, how are we going to make change? How would you go about finding out how to do that? Well, that's a really good example because the big question is, what is the outcome that you're after uh, and how do you measure it? And this is a massive blind spot for public relations because not because you know, there's sort of this trope um, in PR that you know public relations people are the sort of the arts and crafts or the you know the the martini drinkers and they don't really touch data and it's not true, um, but a lot of the time the measurement that PR needs to make decisions is not available because companies refuse to invest in it. Everything in public relations is measurable. Everything. There's not a single thing you cannot measure. The question is whether you're willing to invest in measurement of it or not. For example, brand strength can be measured very easily, right? You have uh, market research, you have surveys, one-on-ones, focus groups, uh, you know, large panel surveys and things like that, continuous data collection. Uh, there are services like SurveyMonkey, Google surveys, et cetera, that can collect data, you know, NPS scores about, you know, what is the likelihood that you are going to recommend this product or service to your friends and family in the next 90 days. All of that data can be used to essentially measure PR outcomes, right? Using things like market mix modeling and uplift modeling, but nobody mm -hmm. invests in it. No one's willing to invest in it. And as a result, PR is sort of left uh, saying, well, just guess at, you know, uh, at what the outcome is. Or even worse, public relations defaults to, well, we don't have any outcomes, so we're just going to report on activities. We got, you know, called this many reporters, we got this many placements, and of course, the CFO is asking, so what, right? Like, mm -hmm. How much money did this turn into for me? Mm -hmm. And because no one's doing the measurement, you can't connect the dots. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about measurement, which I want to dig in on. But what about starting the campaign with data and maybe even measurement, but not measuring your own work? So that's where I don't know, but I feel like possibly 
PR people aren't doing that. And sure, we're all talking about measurement, how to do it. We're all running around in circles, not doing it right, probably. And that's why I want to talk to you about measurement after the campaign. But what about before? And and how do you and does your company help with people f- trying to figure out like what strategy to do or to where to go with the PR before they actually launch a PR campaign? We do. We have done it in the past. Um, uh, most companies don't engage us for that because we are, uh, to put it nicely, reassuringly expensive. Um, and that sort of research is, again, a lot of research that companies are not necessarily always willing to invest in. But there's a ton of things you can do up front, data you can collect that's a matter of public record that you can say, okay, are is this data useful? Is it predictive of the outcomes you care about? One of the things that I think is such a huge miss for PR is branded organic search. When somebody searches for you by name, right? They search for Trust Insights by name or Christopher Penn by name. They have intent, right? They have, you don't search for those things for fun. If you want you know, search for something for fun, you'd be searching like, you know, you know TikTok memes with dogs uh, or whatever. Um, so when you search for something by name, you are flagging some intent. You're signaling intent. If you were to do a competitive landscape and look at, you know, let's say you're doing coffee, right? Uh, and you look at branded organic search for Starbucks near me, Dunkin' Donuts near me, Pete's Coffee near me. You can see the relative strength of those brands based on consumer intent from search data that is publicly available that you can extract from, you know, pretty much any SEO tool that uh, is on the market that's that's reputable. And you can build a case very quickly about not just the overall trend, but regional trends, you know, geographies. Uh, you may even be able to start doing some cross-matching with social data, maybe, um, uh, for things like demographics. You'd be better off running a survey uh, a- after that, You know, doing a pre-market survey. One of the things that we used to do all the time when I worked at a PR agency was fielding market surveys based on search data. So we would know in advance kind of what the major topics were, and then we could dial in very, very quickly into consumer opinions about that specific, the you know, specifics of that topic and get some very actionable data that, you know, the obviously the client could then use for pitching purposes, for creating stories, uh, data journalism, et cetera. So there's a ton of data up front that you can get. Uh, you have to know what it is, what format it's in, and then how to turn it into something usable. And, and to answer your question and put in a shameless plug, yes, we do that. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. So you do mention Google Analytics, um, and I don't know if you mentioned Google Search Console, but in our prep for this interview, I was told to ask you about how to use Google Search Console for PR measurement. And then also maybe you can expand on Google Analytics and possibly those are the same thing. And that's maybe embarrassing that I don't know about it, but maybe not because that's what my tech guy is for. <laughs> the They are different. So Google Analytics, particularly the new version, Google Analytics 4, is about measuring what's happening on the digital properties you own, your website, your mobile app, et cetera. And that tells you what people are doing once they are within your digital sphere of influence. Google Search Console is a tool that Google use, that uh, Google gives to us um, that tells us how people are interacting with their search engine um, as it relates to us. So how they find our website, what terms they're using to find our website, how often we appear in search, um, what modalities, is it is it web search, is it shopping, is it images, is it YouTube search? And so it gives us insight really into that sort of upper funnel stuff. And that's where that branded organic search really is very powerful. Use Google Search Console to say, how often are people searching for trust insights? How often does that search occur? And then how often do we show up in in search results for our own name? You know, the, for a company like us, we have a relatively unique name, so it's it, it's not too we don't you know we're not too really badly off. But there are obviously some companies have very common names. Um, you know, there's a, a company called Tango, right? Uh, and there's of course the dance style and a bunch of other things. And so they would have to do a lot more work to figure out branded organic search for themselves, but. It is a very, very powerful tool for measuring branded organic search, and that data can be used to then calibrate for your PR campaigns to say, we're going to use this as a proxy for brand strength because you can't measure brand strength you know, 24-7. I mean, you can, but it's expensive. Um, and look to see, you know, 
do we see an increase in branded search for our, our company or its products, services, knowing that we have a PR campaign in market right now? doing something like propensity score matching where you could say, okay, well, here's when the PR campaign was active and here's all the other days of the year when it wasn't discounting other channels like pay-per-click and banner ads and YouTube ads and stuff. Can we isolate the lift that PR brought to this search number um, during the period of campaign versus days when the campaign wasn't running? And you can do that. And that's a really good way of saying here is the uplift that PR brought to the strength of that brand. Now, for many companies, when you look in your Google Analytics, you will see that organic search sometimes is 50, 60, 70, 80% of the traffic that comes into a company's website. If organic search is a prominent driver of business for that company in its digital space, then you can say this work that we're doing for branded organic search that we can measure in search console from PR translates to this organic search traffic on a company's website. And then if they've done their job of having goals and goal conversions and goal conversion values, you can say here is the likely forecasted impact of PR from a dollar perspective, right? Because you know that you're helping feed more searches for this company. Those searches can convert into prospects or to leads or to sales and so on and so forth, especially for B2B. That's how you tie these tools together with pub, you know, for public relations use. Okay. And so possibly when you're kind of looking at a company before you even decide to work with them or before you launch a campaign, that is what you're talking about, possibly about going into the back end, looking at, if you can look at their Google Analytics, see how set up they are, and then try to kind of put that in place for your PR measurement. Um, and oftentimes our biggest problem is, you know, maybe we know these things, right? At, at my firm, Veracity, maybe we do. It doesn't really even matter if your client is not set up for to help you with this kind of measurement in terms of Google Analytics. So how do you kind of address that at the front end of a campaign or taking a new client? That's where, again, a lot of those SEO tools can really help because you can see from those tools what sort of the general you know, you know, search in that category looks like. You can look for your, your the potential client and their competitors, sort of put them side by side in a, one of these tools and say, okay, well, they're getting, you know, they've got some velocity for inbound links already. Inbound links are a good proxy for interest, right? If, you, if no one's linking to your website, then you don't really have any interest. Um, and you can get a sense of kind of what kind of uphill battle will you have when you look in, again, a lot of these SEO tools, things have like things like content monitors that allow you to see what content is being created. If you're looking at this client and they're saying, you know, we're going to be the next Microsoft and you go into uh, the SEO tool of your choice and you see that not a single piece of content has been written about them other than them talking about themselves in, for the entire year, you know, you've got a, a, a tough road. You look at their chief competitor in that space and, you know, there's 10,000 articles a month like, OK, we got it. We're going to have to charge a lot more for this retainer because this is going to be an uphill battle both ways in the snow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what you're saying sounds really great. And I'm sure everybody could either be motivated or no offense, but possibly demotivated by this because it just sounds really hard. So especially for people who are either creatives or word people, you know, and we don't have an analytics person on staff, we, you know, we shy away from what we're intimidated by. And so if there's just like one or two simple things that somebody could do to kind of get their feet wet, get used to looking at data, and not only just looking at some stats, like getting in there and like getting your own data, how do you, what should you say to them? <laughs> it depends. So if it's a PR person, you absolutely should be learning how to use SEO tools, particularly keyword tools and content tools, right? <clears throat> that will carry you 85% of the way, because if you learn how to use them, you can learn how to you know set up monitors for your brand, you know, the brands that are under your care and their competitors and get a sense from search like, okay, how is how is this brand and its competitors doing in search? Uh, because search data is so relevant to the behavior of the customer. Um, I, I think that's probably one of the biggest misses that the PR industry as a whole has not embraced uh, and really needs to. And these tools, again, these tools are not built for data scientists. They are built for search marketers. They're, they are built for people who are comfortable with you know numbers and math, but are not math experts by any means. And 
So I think those that's that would be the place I would say someone should start. If you have nothing else, start with the SEO tool of choice that you have in house. And if you don't have one, you've missed the boat, right? You've you, you've the boat left ten years ago and you weren't on it. You're still standing on the dock. Every PR firm on the planet um, should have access to some kind of SEO tool. Mm-hmm. Yes, but. <laughs> we have a lot of freelancers too that are just kind of, you know, on their own and not they don't have the backing of a firm. But but yes, yeah, so we we can get in there, get comfortable. And you do have a data science 101 for marketers workshop, right? At your company. Is that still do, an yes. offering? We, we do, yes. Um, it's not really tailored for PR folks, um, so it wouldn't cover some of the data sources, but definitely does teach you how to generally think about numbers. And I think that is a useful training uh, for people. But again, I would... I wouldn't say that you need that. And this sounds weird because I should be plugging my own stuff. Uh, but <laughs> you it's really okay, it's honest. With, yeah, you should start with the SEO st- tools first. Be- again, because people will ask Google or the search engine of your choice, question they would never, ever, ever say out loud, right? We will ask search engine things that if we asked another human, we'd basically be admitting we don't know how to do our jobs, right? Like, you know, uh, PR pitching template. They'll slyly type in when no one's mm-hmm, looking, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, there's there's an entire book uh, called Everybody Lies. It talks about the things people type into Google the most. You know, with compare, you know, the, what's the the average size of a certain part of your anatomy? Things, all oh, the stuff you never say aloud to another human being. That mm. includes. <laughs> all this intent about brands, right? You don't want to, you know that the moment you pick up the phone and call a company, you're going to get uh, someone from sales and they're going to harass you until either you're dead or they're dead, one of the two. Um, but you'll Google them because you can learn about that company without having to deal with a salesperson breathing down your neck, right? So mm-hmm. learning how search intent and and how public relations can affect it is probably one of the easiest and most powerful things that you can do as a PR practitioner, as an agency, uh, as an in-house person. And the data is out there. It's reasonably good. It's reasonably clean. Uh, and you don't have to be an expert to, to start manipulating it. Mm-hmm. Well, and it's also how you can kind of present your case to the, uh, what did you call it? The hippo problem? What is exactly. that? The highest paid person problem? The highest individually paid person's opinion. <laughs> yeah. No, I love that. I know that um, some clients use PR firms just to kind of back whatever it is that they're trying to tell the the hippo. Mm. But now, you know, some, some hippos just don't even trust a PR firm. So now we have some data. Um, and some times <laughs> some hippos might even think that websites aren't even all that important. And so if we have some backing and strategy to kind of look at, you know, how many people are searching, um, that would help us do our jobs and try to take more traditional PR online, possibly. It depends, though. I mean, there are certain cases. There are some some industries where it is very much still an old boys network. And the way you get into that industry is either steak dinners and golf. Right. And that is it because there's five decision makers in the entire industry. Um, and, and, you know, they are rare, but they do exist. You know, some parts of the defense industry are like that. Um, and so you have to have, you know, as a PR agency or as a firm or as a department, you have to have the the flexibility and the, the a wide skill set on your bench to be able to tackle the very very different situations that you will be you'll find yourself pitching uh, and working with clients and you know one of the part of the reason we stopped working in PR and founded a data science firm is because that was not stuff that was of interest it wasn't our specialty you know um, my partner and I Katie were like you know we want to focus on the data and the analytics side and not the you know dealing with humans. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of not dealing with humans, um, have you taught, I feel like I saw somewhere something that you were talking about or writing about regarding PR and AI and the connection there. And possibly because one question I had for you is where is PR going, you know, and is it more with artificial intelligence or data, obviously, which can also kind of tie back into AI. So artificial intelligence is an umbrella term. It just basically means 
teaching machines to replicate tasks that typically required human intelligence. And the areas that PR, I think, will be affected most by it are around content creation. There are are some amazing usable tools today in market. Well, they're usable models uh, that, again, if you have a very technical background, you can put to work today um, that generate content. So I, you know, an example I give in a lot of my keynotes is I'll take the first paragraph of a press release and put it into one of these language generation models. The, you know, one of the more recent ones is the GPT Neo X uh, data set. And it will spit out, it will essentially auto completes the rest of the press release, sometimes better than the original. Um, sometimes the, the writing is better and more clear and, and punchier than the original. <clears throat> because to be perfectly honest, a press release is pretty templated, right? It's, it's you know, overblown bombastic statement, two pull quotes from the CEO that the CEO never said, so the PR person had to uh, just write and stick the CEO's name on it. Um, an additional set of uh, benefits and features that nobody cares about, and then uh, contact information at the bottom. That's basically a press release, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and nobody reads them. Um, mm -hmm. So generating them is pretty straightforward, hmm. and so machines can do <laughs> first draft. I'm excited now, because just FYI, the most important part of the press release is the first paragraph. And so if we're just writing that, then the rest of what we write is just for the client, right? Just to show that we've written something because that's what they expect. Um, and so uh, AI, that's kind of an interesting thought. Um, I love that. So is anything else that you have that just any last kind of tips for people who not necessarily are new to the industry, but pe people that have been in the industry for a long time and are used to doing the things that they do and um, might be only intimidated by um, doing things a new way. The fundamental thing that we have to keep in mind, and this is regardless of all the technology we've talked about is that you now live in a world of extreme uncertainty. The last two years, a global pandemic certainly was, was an interesting uh, start to the this decade. Uh, the fact that we are in the midst essentially of World War III, which started about six years ago, um, means that we are in times of exceptional uncertainty. And if you are used to doing things the way they've always been done, that world is gone, right? There is no getting, quote, back to normal. There is no normal. And so the thing that I could urge you the most is be mentally flexible, be mentally agile, accept that rapid, unforeseeable, unpredictable change is the norm. I was on a client call this week and we were looking over the forecast that we put together for their search uh, marketing to say, okay, here's the, the stuff that's going to spike in, in search. They are in the automotive space. Guess what? With the, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, that has sent the energy markets into the stratosphere. Your gas here is about $5 a gallon as of this recording. By the time you listen to it, maybe $6 a gallon. And so some of the content that this client had is suddenly very, very relevant where previously we were forecasting it wouldn't be relevant till like April or May. Well, times change, right? There's so much uncertainty that you've got to have the A, the agility and B, the inventory to draw upon to react very, very, very fast and tastefully, right? No, never, ever uh, market a tragedy. Um, that's the world now. And so mm -hmm. if anytime you hear the words, this is the way we've always done, immediately pull out a taser and taser that person because mm -hmm. that person <laughs> is, is a danger to their marketing. Mm hmm. Well, and the other thing, it shouldn't be too hard to think of things in a new way, because PR people, we should be used to, because we have to follow the news and react to the news, there is no standard day. And so there isn't a standard way of doing things. I mean, sure, there's ethics and possibly kind of the way you treat your contacts, whether they're virtual or at print or whatnot. Those are those don't change. But you know, the themes that we use definitely has changed. It changes day to day. And it, this isn't new. So we can look at um, technology and data to uh, in that way and kind of change with it. Yep. And, and it's not just technology. It's, it's all everything. Everything has changed and everything is uncertain. And the faster you become comfortable with that, uh, when my martial arts teacher says it best, you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And that's something that is the, the current reality and it's unlikely to change for the next decade.
Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you did bring up martial arts. So I guess I will ask you the question I had originally, which I thought was maybe a little weird. But what is your fascination with knives? Do you have a fascination? (laughs) Oh, I thought I wouldn't call it a fascination. I collect them. I've been uh, training in the martial arts now for 32 years. Uh, and that's one of the many, many tools that uh, we've had to learn how to use proficiently. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just watching um, pieces of her. I'm not going to give it away. But yeah, there's something in there with a the knife. Anyway, well, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everybody has learned a lot. And where can we find you? Best place to go is trustinsights.ai for uh, all business related stuff. If you want personal stuff, including some random rants and stuff, you can find that at ChristopherSPen.com. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for listening. For more PR insight, be sure to check out Amy's book, A Modern Guide to Public Relations at prtalk.co. Also, please subscribe, rate, or leave us a review.